In the age of Aquarius, which we are now entering, astrology will gradually evolve toward that which is known as esoteric astrology. Esoteric astrology looks toward causes rather than effects, to the life of the human soul that lies behind the outer form, the body. The soul is that imperishable, perpetual existence that takes repeated cyclic embodiments in male or female bodies throughout the eons of time and in varying cultures. Part of its purpose is to expand consciousness and to work out karma. Most astrology practiced today is personality astrology. That ranges from the mundane to the very spiritually oriented. Whether we are considering fortune-telling astrology or the more serious psychological astrology that strives to help bring about integration and wholeness, we are still limited by the tools with which we work. So traditional astrology, exoteric astrology, uh, is often what we see in newspapers or uh, the column in the magazine, and it often has a lot to do with our personality needs and desires and when will I meet XYZ, when will I have XYZ, you know, and it has a very concrete focus. Esoteric astrology, no surprise, is interested in the soul gift Esoteric astrology is soul-centered astrology. It's the astrology that is interested in something beyond the personality. It's interested in something beyond the material world. It's interested in the cause behind the effect. In the esoteric philosophy, astrology is an important structure of thought, and it actually has another name. It's also been called the science of relations. Because astrology is really a story or a way of looking at things that has to do with the relationship between the macrocosm and the microcosm, the big picture and the human small picture, and what is the relationship between those two things. Esoteric astrology is to do with soul-centered consciousness, someone who is aspiring to expressing the soul, who is awoken to a sense of soul, as opposed to the personality is just the threefold lower self working in the lower worlds without any necessarily any connection or inspiration from the soul. So we have exoteric or personality-based astrology, which of course is by far the most popular astrology, because the masses haven't really awoken to soul yet but it also provides a vehicle for people who have awoken to soul and is certainly a bona fide and legitimate form of astrology to practice, particularly psychological, humanistic astrology. Um, the fatalistic astrology, of course, is, is, um, is of the past, is of the Piscean age. It's, um, it doesn't really promote a, a, a good image of how the new astrology is evolving which has much more to do with free choice, free will, and using astrology as an empowering tool rather than being a, a fated victim of the, of the stars. In the simplest terms, we can say that exoteric astrology is the astrology which concerns itself with the personality, its happiness, and its fate. Esoteric astrology, which is not yet fully developed by any means, concerns itself with the astrology of the soul. But to be humble about it, we have to say that at present esoteric astrology concerns itself with the expression of the soul through the personality. I always say that we had better not be simply an esoteric astrologer because a good esoteric astrologer is also a good exoteric astrologer. Traditional astrology often looks at 
a chart and tries to understand more of the mundane aspects of life. Esoteric astrology looks at a chart and sees much more of the subtle, deeper, soulful potentiality. It's trying to understand or share or reveal how the soul wants to pattern the nature of consciousness in the life, and it also reveals how the lower self may get into the way of that or inhibit that process and what can be done to resolve that issue so that forward movement can indeed occur. So when we study esoteric astrology, we study the great cycles of the evolution of consciousness, but we also study our own human growth and we learn how we can give more fully of ourselves, how we can give our truest soul gift. The study of the moment that we're born, each of us is born, the moment a planet is born, the moment a country is born, how does it stand in relationship to the great cosmos? One of the major new tools is the study of the seven rays. They are seven streams of energy which enter this solar system from cosmic sources and condition every life form within it. The seven rays emanate from the seven stars of the Great Bear constellation and summarize the combined energies of seven solar systems of which ours is but one. The seven solar systems act like chakras or energy centers within the body of a great cosmic being. The star Sirius and also the seven sisters of the Pleiades form a triangle of energies with the seven rishis of the great bear and are considered esoterically as a major conditioning influence on this solar system. For just as the soul is to our personality, so too Sirius is to our sun. There is a whole study of rayology that many of us have never heard of. We perhaps have heard of astrology, we perhaps have heard of psychology. But rayology is a whole branch that reveals a, a whole new way to look at our psychological makeup, to look at our astrological makeup. So in rayology, there are the seven primary rays, and each ray has a fundamental quality, and each of us has a rayological makeup that we can only learn through our own investigation. I think everybody who has studied human nature realizes that beneath all the diversity of outer behavior there seem to be some fundamental orientations in the human being. But if we study the orientation of these people who have different combinations of the seven energies, we're going to learn their psychology. We're going to learn what they're cut out to do. We're going to learn what they are destined to do. We're going to learn the source of their happiness, their joy, their bliss. We're going to find out where not to put them and where to put them, you know? The seven rays are really seven great energetic beings that are evolving as everything is evolving. And there are seven different qualities that imbue everything. So in the human constitution, there is a soul ray, there's a personality ray, there's a mental ray, there's an emotional ray, and there's a physical etheric ray. And as we begin to understand our, our rayological makeup, we learn a tremendous amount about our particular energy structure. And just as we have particular rayological makeups, so do countries. So do planets. So does humanity as a whole.
Esoteric astrology gives a larger perspective of life, that we are not just a little planet on its own, but participating as an energy center within a greater body of manifestation. The seven rays which come into this solar system are the missing link in modern day astrology. The planets are simply vehicles for these energies and transmit them to Earth via the zodiac, whose signs have varied and specific resonances with the seven ray energies. The seven rays are intimately related to esoteric astrology from a couple perspectives. First is that the seven rays find their access into our earthly experience through the zodiacal signs and planets. Each of the seven rays finds a entrance point through three different signs of the zodiac. In addition, the seven rays are evident in planets because planets are of course living entities and they too have a soul nature and they too have a personality nature and different planets are animations or living beings along different ray lines. So esoteric astrology takes all of that into consideration when trying to interpret a person's chart. The simple explanation for the astrological signs is that they are templates for human evolution of consciousness. They are in fact more esoterically viewed groupings of celestial beings that impart their, their consciousness to humanity. So as the sun goes through a particular sign during an age of Pisces or an age of Aquarius, 2160 years, we are getting the information or the, the frequencies being transmitted from these particular groupings of beings uh, known as astrological signs, known as zodiacal signs. That's the, the more esoteric interpretation. But we can see that these signs also just simply as lenses that have different frequencies, different energies associated with them, associated with fire, with air, with water, with earth. And of course, we have all our individual birth charts that are a mixture of these signs with various planets in these signs and various configurations with one another that the soul can use in any particular incarnation to further its expression of consciousness, but also the working off of karma. The ray energies can also be studied by themselves and constitute what is known as esoteric psychology. Yet before discussing some techniques of esoteric astrology, let us first take a look at some tabulations on the seven rays. The key is to recognize these patterns as they manifest through you. Ray 1, Will and Power. Ray 2, Love Wisdom. Ray 3, Active Intelligence and Adaptability. Ray 4, Harmony, Beauty and Art. Ray 5, Concrete Knowledge or Science. Ray 6, Abstract Idealism or Devotion. Ray 7, Ceremonial Order or Ritual. Once you become familiar with the seven ray energies, and once you have acquired a general sense of which ray energies are expressing through you, then you will want to get more specific 
and isolate which body the ray energy is manifesting through. For example, you may have a seventh ray physical body, a second ray emotional body, a third ray mental body with a fifth ray personality, and a first ray soul. Unless you know the rays in your own nature, you can have a tougher time finding out where you belong and what you should be doing. So the whole new psychology is going to depend upon knowing these seven fundamental energies and how they affect your physical body, your etheric body, your astral body motions, your, your mental body, your soul, and the higher parts of your system, even your spirit. You've got to have a formula and the different energies will be part of this formula and it will always be based on the number seven. Plus, if you want to add to it, and you should, you're going to want to know what your astrology is doing and how your astrology is interacting with those seven energies. Then you will have a pretty good picture of yourself and you'll know how to operate in time and space so as to make more rapid evolution and help other people make more rapid evolution too. Know thyself, know the seven energies. Your personality traits and characteristics are quantified by your outer objective life, whilst your soul characteristics and qualities are quantified by your inner subjective life. Hence, the ray governing your personality will be much more easy to isolate. Though, with deep contemplative meditation, your soul ray can also be discovered. The personality ray presents itself in a much more obvious manner. That's what we see first when we meet a person. We see the personality ray. It is in our every gesture. It is in how we speak. It is in how we interact. The soul ray is a subtler, uh, requires a subtler listening, requires a subtler seeing. It has much more to do, it's much more qualitative and something that you experience perhaps through getting a little quieter and listening a little more deeply. Planets rule rays similarly to astrological rulerships, hence the interface between rays, planets, and zodiacal signs. However, do not make the mistake of trying to ascertain the rays directly from the horoscope. Determining the rays, then interpreting the horoscope in light of the rays is ideally the correct procedure. A horoscope is a map of the heavens. It is a blueprint of our birth. It's actually a two-dimensional picture of the heavens when we're born. So. You can see here that there are 12 different sections in this circle, and each of those sections is a piece of the heavens. But in our astrological chart, each of those sections is actually an area of our life. So what we begin to see is these archetypal energies, the planets housed in different areas of the heavens, different areas of our life, and what impact they're having there. The beauty of an astrological chart is that it's a map for us to follow and to navigate so that we can give our greatest gift, which is connected to the rising sign, the ascendant of the horoscope. Everything is in service to that point. Well, that's what the horoscope actually is, a snapshot in time of the moment at which we are born with all the interrelationships of the energies about which we know. There are so many energies we don't know about. We have certain planets, we have certain asteroids, we have certain moons and planetoids. We know a little bit, but there's so much that is hidden. Anyway, at a particular moment, these 
these different astronomical factors are configured in a certain manner in relation to each other. And the geometry of the moment tells us the energy and force relationships of the moment. And into that sea of energy and forces, the individual soul is precipitated. And at the moment of birth, and some have said at the moment of the first breath, the ambient energies and forces are impressed upon the substance of the individual and hold that configuration within the expression of that individual over the lifetime. That's a very complicated issue. You know, how it is that the moving horoscope actually works and how energies are and forces are in a way embedded in the substance and consciousness of the individual. But that's what we have learned. The moment of birth, the moment of the first breath, is of extreme importance in determining what energies impress and continue to condition the individual as he or she grows. Even the conformation of the form will follow the impression of those energies. Many babies are, in a sense, indistinct, naturally, and not fully developed, and you don't exactly know what they're going to look like when they grow up, but that moment of impression will determine even the outer form. And if you don't believe it, just study people, study their birth time, and see how they look. Sometimes I say astrology is as plain as the nose on your face if you will just study physiognomy. You'll see it proved. This esoteric knowledge of oneself does not come instantaneous, but will emerge after patient pondering and meditating. It will take time, but be patient and mindful of the patterns in your day-to-day -day life. The birth sign is the sign of identity, and it can be understood uh, as identity as soul or identity as personality. While the rising sign is incredibly important, both for traditional view and esoteric view, but for different reasons. See, the rising sign is the sign that's cresting at the eastern horizon at the moment of your birth. Traditional astrology was, will say that the rising sign holds a clue to persona, that is to say, it says something about how you as a personality are seen in the world or how you'd like to be seen, and sometimes it's been correlated to body image. Esoteric astrology says, yes, yes, that's all true, but goes on to say that when a person is on the path, then the rising sign has a higher meaning because it can represent the soul's deeper intention for this incarnation. You see, because it's the sign, as I said, that is cresting in the east, and the east is the direction of the spirit, and it's rising, so it can symbolize the soul's rising intention. Let's begin with something that's not a planet. Let's begin with the rising sign. That is the driving energy, which if properly used, takes you ever closer to the center of your own soul life. So that if you think of yourself as a Virgo because your son is in Virgo, you should think of yourself more as an Aquarius if your rising sign is Aquarius. I'm an Aries type, but that's in my personality. As a soul, the energy of the sign Cancer, my rising sign, will take me closer to my soul fulfillment for this incarnation. In esoteric astrology, the moon plays a pivotal or important role, as it does with all astrology systems. But in the esoteric view, when a person is on the path, that is to say, when a person has awoken to their higher nature, then the moon starts to have an added quality of understanding. It is said to be the symbol of the prison of the soul. That is to say, it can represent certain instinctual tendencies and patterns within consciousness that inhibit the soul from being more effective. So much of the path 
has to do with transforming or solving the so-called problem of the moon in one's chart. The moon represents the past and the conditioning of what's called your lunar vehicles, your physical, emotional, and mental self. It is the subconscious self, and I just say it in the briefest possible way. The seven rays condition all life, whether it be a mineral, an animal, a tree, a human, an organization, a city, or nation. The rays have their own cycle periods, which connect with the greater astrological ages of 2,160 years. And on the greater turn of the spiral, which corresponds with the great year of 25,920 years. We have just finished a major cycle of Ray 6 in the Piscean Age and are entering a seventh Ray cycle which overlaps the Aquarian Age. These rays and ages have their sympathetic resonances, of course, ensuring maximum effect upon humanity. So just as we incarnate, the ray energies have a similar cycle. They come into incarnation and they leave incarnation. And we are at an interesting moment in time where the sixth ray is exiting and the seventh ray cycle is beginning. So just as we have these cycles, so too the rays have these cycles of incarnation. The transition from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius began in the 16-1700s, uh, particularly around the time that Uranus was discovered in 1781 between the American and French revolutions. Of course, Uranus is regarded as the planet of revolution. So we can look at the 500-year cusp of this 2,000-odd year cycle as starting around about that time or a little bit before that time. And of course, this will bring us up to about 2200 AD and uh, that will see us pretty much in the age of Aquarius by then. But energetically, now people who are responding to the frequencies of the vibrations of Aquarius are Aquarian in nature and are responding to the Aquarian energies. Whereas those who are still responding to the frequencies of Pisces uh, are stuck in that old paradigm. It's clear that we're in that transitional period. But because it's a transitional period between one strongly influential ray pattern and a sign pattern and a new ray and sign pattern, that's going to have an effect on the collective consciousness of humanity. And it leads to heightened polarization between types of people, between nations, between um, everything that is um, attitudinally playing out in the world today is a manifestation of increased polarization, whether we're talking about polarization with political views, social views. Um, there's, a, there's a growing tension between a group of people in the world who are sensing a new and promising paradigm of consciousness and are trying to more and more live it, as compared to a huge number of people that are still deeply identified with the old paradigm and it leads, therefore, to a more conservative perspective on things. And this is a natural byproduct that arises because underlying that polarization in humanity is a, uh, you might say, a conflicted energy between two great astrological forces. It is said in the esoteric philosophy that we will not be fully out of the Piscean era, or I say fully beyond the overlap period, until the year 2117.
Esoteric astrology has been called the science of all sciences because it is a system of relating every living entity together, a planet, a ray, a sign, or human being, etc. It describes the qualities and energies of these living beings, thereby allowing comprehension and also understanding how these beings interact with one another. Therefore, it is truly the science of relationship, human, planetary, zodiacal, and stellar. When the word science is used in this presentation, bear in mind that it refers not only to concrete analysis that employs the tangible senses of which our academic world is based upon, but rather the esoteric sciences of the higher intuitive or abstract mind, which sees the whole synthetically and inclusively. The disciplines of esoteric astrology and the ageless wisdom incorporate the concrete tangible senses, but also draw upon that intangible sixth sense, or intuition. Because of its emphasis on the inner or subjective side of life, Esoteric means hidden, or understood by the selected few. This is not to be misunderstood as any kind of elitism. What was esoteric becomes mainstream eventually. Yet there will always be a core that remains esoteric, waiting to be unveiled by the spiritual generations of humanity. The similar word occult means hidden beyond the bounds of ordinary knowledge or of a nature not understood as physical qualities. In itself, occult does not have the negative implication much that the media has promoted. Those who have done the necessary work and have undergone various disciplines such as meditation and have developed these subtle senses are ready to receive esoteric knowledge. The unprepared would have no foundation within which to ground it, though many people are becoming more and more capable of developing these faculties as human consciousness evolves more and more throughout time. It's important for humanity to understand their true origins because they can start to consciously participate in the, in the divine plan uh, far more. And this, is, this will occur in the double Aquarian cycle that we're going into because it's the, not only the age of exoteric science, but it's the age of spiritual science. And so occultism or spiritual science or esotericism, as it's called, uh, will teach humanity these, these uh, perennial philosophies, these, uh, these eternal truths about their origin, and it will, um, it will create a resonance and an impact and a, and a recognition by humanity of those truths that will, um, uh, that will inspire them to, to participate in the greater plan, to find their, their place, their niche within the greater plan, and especially during the age of Aquarius, within their own group that is taking on a portion of that greater plan.
Astrology is based upon illusion, in the sense that the zodiac is built around the ecliptic plane, the apparent path of the sun around the earth. Of course we know that the path of the earth, or orbit, is around the sun, so we work with this paradox, in the knowledge that eventually humanity will transcend this illusion. This is the source of one of our greatest mysteries. Of course we know from exoteric, or mainstream science, that the sun and moon both have physical, emotional, and mental effects. These are well documented in our earthly tides, full moon cycles, in sunspot activity, and the growth that occurs in nature, validated by many scientific experiments and discoveries. The problem of recognizing energy currents really comes down to understanding that they are electromagnetic energies of the planets, which manifest in varying degrees, from the most dense to the very subtle. Modern science cannot yet measure energies of a very rarefied or etheric nature, and therefore have not yet recognized them. The planets transmit the ray energies through the zodiac, and the zodiacal sign is another electromagnetic pattern. Hence there is a combination of three groups of electromagnetic patterns, rays, planets, and zodiacal signs. We could also talk about the Earth as this great living entity that has a dynamic electromagnetic field around it, just as every planet is a living entity that is growing and evolving. And these are all in the web of the sun's energy. And this is really the point of origin for all these astrological energies. And so any planet has this field that extends to Earth and extends to each of us. So we all are experiencing each of the planets as a, a great sphere of energy at any given time. So when we're born, what is our relationship to each of these great living entities that are overlapping and that are surrounding us with their spheres of particular qualities and energies? We have to find out what the ether is. It has been dismissed from science with the Michelson-Morley experiment regarding the speed of light, but now it has to return, and the method by which the energy centers that we call planets are conveying their particular energy to our planet and to other planets has to be understood as etheric conduction. So until the ether is more fully understood, the modus operandi of planets, planetary energy reaching us will not be understood. However, it gets thicker because planets are the bodies of great intelligences or deities, the ageless wisdom tells us. And so, where are the planets? Are they just rocks uh, revolving around the sun? Or are they celestial deities who are in fact present, whose consciousness is present? We're in a room here. There are several of us. We are all present to each other. Our consciousness is affecting each other, our words, our thoughts, and we are immediately here even though there are so many feet between us. It's the same way with the solar system. The planets are all in each other's presence. They are omnipresent in their consciousness. And according to their movements, around the sun and their geometrical configurations, so the intensity of their consciousness changes and alters with respect to any particular target, such as the Earth. Right now, let's say Jupiter may be very intense with respect to our particular planet and less intense or more intense with respect to another. Planets are the outer form of great celestial intelligences who are omnipresent to each other within the solar system. But until we 
accept some of the metaphysical principles of the secret doctrine, we will not be open to the real explanation. At first, we're going to start searching for all these physical explanations, and we will find some. But the real influence of the planets and of the constellations has to do with the fact that they are bodies of deities who are present to each other, interacting with each other, just like any group would interact, like any group members would interact with each other, and they are affecting each other accordingly. This will not be a satisfactory explanation for scientists at their present level of interest and development. But once they become metaphysical in their inquiry, it will make more sense. And once the ethers are discovered and the modes of conduction of subtle energies, then at least some physical handle on the process will be realized. In science, we would talk about planets having an electromagnetic field. In esotericism, we would say that yes, and that that field has a livingness to it and that that field is intimately connected with the etheric body, the etheric nature of that planet, just like you and I have an electrical magnetic field, but it's intimately related to or connected with the thing that we call the etheric body and the chakra system. The seven ray energies correspond to many septenaries which provide the basic building blocks of occultism. The seven ray energies can also be perceived and experienced through color and sound. The seven colors and sounds of the rays provide a more intuitive approach to understanding. For instance, ray 7 corresponds to the note of G and the color violet, depending upon which octaves are being used. It's not that sevenfoldness is the only way to make sense out of the structure of our cosmos, but it's a very important one. But when we start talking about real functionality, the way man exists in the world, we will focus on the number seven. It's the musical uh, basis of the construction of the universe. It is the basis of the octave. It's the basis of the color wheel. Uh, it is the basis of the chakric system, the system of centers in the bioelectric field that we call the etheric body. So the study of the number seven is extremely important, not the only study, but very important. Each of the seven rays has its own unique color and sound, and that color and sound reflect the texture and quality of the ray. There's so much more than this uh, physical reality. There are seven planes of consciousness. And if you could imagine, they are all interpenetrating one another. So as esotericists, we want to understand that everything is in motion. We can't think about these seven rays as seven lines of light or color streaming down from the cosmos. We want to think of them almost as this light and color spinning together with ceaseless movement and different combinations. Sound and color are also measurable in terms of their vibratory capacity, and this is well documented, although beyond the scope of this discussion. We live in a dualistic world, and the unresolved opposites within us is a prime reason why we reincarnate. These pairs of opposites exist on all planes of consciousness, but particularly on the emotional or astral plane for most of humanity. 
Great conflict is generated between the light of the soul and the unredeemed aspects of our lower nature, both in regards to the individual human unit and humanity as a whole. A lot of people simply respond to the personality seven. They never really become more than personalities. They are a soul, of course, but they haven't reached the point where they can bring through their soul energy expressing through the personality. So a lot of people, well, some people are not even integrated personalities. They just have to go through the sevenness of their mental body, their emotional body, and their physical etheric body. But for other people who have pulled it all together and kind of are integrated in the world and intelligent and self-motivating, there are seven different types. A will and power type, you know, first energy. A love and wisdom type, teacher. Empath, second energy. The third type is uh, the thinker, the commercial individual, the, the planner, the one who can manifest many things and has great ideas, third type. The artist, torn by conflict and having harmony eventually, the fourth type. Fifth type, the scientist, the accurate student of nature and of all things. Sixth type, the devotee, the religious type. And the seventh type, get it all in order, organizing the world, the magician, okay. And they all have colors and they all have sounds. Very interesting too, the different notes associated with these different types. But basically, we've got seven personality types doing different things in the world. But should the seven soul types get a hold of those personalities, then you're gonna have a conflict. And that conflict is gonna be between the selfless, giving, altruistic soul energy and that more selfish, self-assertive personality energy. And that's the big psychological dynamic that is happening in the lives of so many people today. And then you have, then you have duality appearing. Some people say, I'm integrated, I know who I am. But wait a second, something, I'm, I deserve my midlife crisis, right? Okay, something is calling me to a higher um, possibility. And I have a conflict between everything I used to do and everything I might do. And then comes the battle between the soul energy, one of seven, and the personality energy, one of seven. And these are the dynamics of the new esoteric psychology, all based upon the septonate. Astrology is a fantastic tool for understanding not only that relationship, but how that relationship is trying to unfold consciousness to its next level of development. And it can also reveal those aspects in our lower consciousness that are going to be the challenge points uh, that have to be overcome and transformed in order for that higher part of us, the soul, to move forward uh, in its expansive awareness. One of the main causes for the unprecedented turmoil this past century has been due to much of humanity facing its shadow self collectively, so that many are now poised to take initiation or a great expansion of consciousness. The successful outcome of this great event will trigger some major revelations of the existence of the human soul the truth about death and rebirth, and the existence of the Deva or angelic kingdom. Planetary turmoil is also due to the cusp of the ages moving from Pisces into Aquarius, and the coincidence of many lesser ray and planetary cycles within a shorter period of time. The Ageless Wisdom tells us that there are many advanced souls coming into incarnation at this time, corresponding with the incoming seventh ray cycle of the Aquarian Age. The bodies of many of these advanced souls are vibrating at a higher level than average humanity today, and they will not respond that well to the old and outdated energies of the Piscean Age.
Some astrologers make the mistake of bringing a certain fatalism into their readings by stating that this is thus and so, therefore, that is how it's going to be. This leaves no free choice for an individual so that they can creatively work with their birth pattern in the horoscope. We are not the fated victims of our horoscopes, although the soul has elected to work off karma with certain challenges and obstructions. We have also brought in plenty of skills with which to surmount these problems so that we can be conscious co-creators of our destiny. In fact, it is up to us to develop our inner senses so that we can better perceive the subtle world around us and within. Also central to esoteric astrology is the concept of sacred and non-sacred planets. Non-sacred planets such as Mars, Pluto, the Moon, and Earth influence the physical, emotional, and mental bodies. The other planets, which are sacred, help to integrate the personality and make it an instrument of the soul. Because planets are actually viewed as entities, they're like you and I. And they have the same quality of instrumentation. They have a, a causal body, a soul nature, personality, mental body, emotional body, physical body, and etheric body. And a planet is therefore a, a living entity. In esoteric astrology, there are two categories of planets, a sacred planet and a non-sacred planet. Most of the planets in our solar system are said to be sacred, there's a, sh a uh, there's a few that are non-sacred. The, the definition of, or the differential understanding of it is that a sacred planet has a soul nature that has taken dominion over its personality. In other words, a sacred planet is a planet whose higher consciousness has won the day over its lower consciousness. A non-sacred planet is a planet where the personality of that planet is still holding a stronger power or influence uh, compared to its soul nature. All planets are evolving and eventually every planet in our solar system will become a sacred planet. Planetary gods that are not sacred are like human beings who are not spiritual. They have not yet cosmically taken certain initiations which will make them cosmically spiritual. In terms of their effect upon the human being, the non-sacred planets, i.e. those that have not taken a certain fifth initiation from a planetary perspective, affect the personality of the human being. These planets are the planet which the sun veils, the planet which the moon veils, Earth, Mars, Pluto. Those are the five, in our system, non-sacred planets. The others are sacred planets, and they have all taken this particular fifth initiation, which renders their energy applicable to soul development and soul expression in man. The sacred planets are Vulcan, Ray 1, Jupiter, Ray 2, Saturn, Ray 3, Mercury, Ray 4, Venus, Ray 5, Neptune, Ray 6, Uranus, Ray 7. So we should discriminate when we look at a horoscope between the effect of sacred and non-sacred planets, expecting more of a spiritual nature from the sacred planets which work more upon the soul nature of man as it expresses through the personality. When we're dealing with non-sacred planets and the non-sacred houses associated with those planets, we deal more with the personality per se. And there is a friction between these two and we have to learn how to harmonize that friction.
Therefore, understanding the sacred and non-sacred planets allows the astrologer to give more specific guidance. Likewise, a whole new reconsideration of exaltation, detriment, and fall as indicating the three phases of the path will help to revolutionize astrology. A correct reappraisal of the decadence, those subsections of the signs, is another emerging technique. It is said that they will reveal the immediate life opportunity exact nature of the next spiritual step forward, and the precise nature of initiatory challenges. A major theme to consider as an integral part of esoteric astrology is the science of initiation. From life to life, we initiate activities through awareness generated by unfolding realizations and consciousness. Although we do take a ritual initiation in our subjective state, or inner body, it is really only an acknowledgement of the work we have already done. Our sense of responsibility has earned us the right to use energies that we may not have been able to contact before. These initiations relate to the coordination and control of our various bodies, physical, emotional, and mental. For example, one of the most difficult initiations to take is that of the emotional body, which one experiences in the sign Scorpio. At this initiation, Mars and Pluto put us through the crucible experience, whilst the energies of Venus, Neptune, and Jupiter are very strong in expressing the love-wisdom principle. And so, the emotions and desires of the solar plexus chakra are successfully repolarized to the lotus of the heart, where they are expressed as selfless love. In parallel, much of humanity is poised to take the first initiation, the birth of soul awareness firmly anchored in the cave of the heart. We can see humanity as many units or atoms of consciousness within the body of our planetary Logos. Our awareness of this great being, incarnate as Earth, and all the myriad life streams within it, expands as we evolve and grow. The Aquarian Age that we're going into now is a 2,160-year precession cycle. However, we are told in the teachings in the Ageless Wisdom that currently this precession cycle is coinciding with a greater 25,000-year Aquarian cycle. So we have a double Aquarian cycle, which we are told is a time of unique opportunity and has only happened for the seventh time in the history of the fifth root race. And, and of course, Aquarius is the sign of the water bearer. It's about humanity working together far more closely as community, in groups, in, in conscious cooperation with one another. It's also about developing technologies and so forth, but for the good of humanity. The study of esoteric astrology is such a beautiful way into understanding our innate gifts and understanding ourselves so we know who we are, who, who we are at the most intimate and true levels so that we in fact know what to give. If we know who we are, we'll know what to do. There are many things that we've talked about regarding esoteric astrology and all of them, when we put it all together, it helps us to realize the absolute livingness of the larger system that we're in and that you and I are living constituent parts 
of a larger being, a larger set of beings that are part of cosmos. And this is all about understanding your relationship to the larger whole. So esoteric astrology is a tremendously useful tool to understand the journey of life and to have both an experiential and intellectual understanding of how you are a divine spark of life within a greater life and that you have a purpose to play within that greater life. Esoteric astrology is a beautiful science, art, study that allows us to look at one another with incredible compassion and see that we're all on a journey of ev evolving to our best selves. And esoteric astrology is a, is a great dance and we all play a part and we all move with the cycles and we can all celebrate the journey that we're on through this study.